in which love is the spirit. We are glad you are here, whether you're, whether you're joining us from West Hartford, Connecticut, or anywhere in the world. I'm Mike Zanta, one of your representatives on the board. We have Zoom fellowship times for our community throughout the week, as well as before and after worship on Sunday. You can find out more information about those gatherings by getting onto our mailing list through the contact page on our website. Please do read our weekly, our weekly communications, which have returned to Friday. They're our best way to stay connected to you. Online worship is a bit different from being in the sanctuary. Technology sometimes fails us. We appreciate your graciousness when that happens. Today's order of service will appear in the chat box or the YouTube description. We'll have our Zoom fellowship time at about 1045 after worship ends. If you're attending through Zoom today, please stay online, even if you need to, even if you need to step away for a short break to join in conversations with one another. Please take a moment to wave hello to one another and to everyone watching on our live stream. And now, please take a moment to turn off your email and other apps, put the keyboard away and settle in for worship. Please join me everyone in speaking the words of our affirmation. It's in your description. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. So I've noticed that this year there is an awful lot of articles and material written and put out about what is the 4th of July? 
Shouldn't it be on the second since that's when this piece was signed? And shouldn't it be this sort of thing? And isn't it that sort of thing? And what are we going to do if we can't all sit together out on a blanket and watch fireworks? What kind of 4th of July is this? Now, there have been a lot of fireworks, from what I understand, happening all over the country for a while now. Um, I have some friends who live in some cities who say that there have been too many fireworks for too long, and it's actually really exhausting. It is a weird 4th of July. There's no doubt about it. But the 4th of July does mean something, whether there are fireworks or not. Whether it's on the 2nd or the 4th. It's that moment in which we celebrate and recognize a moment of independence. We cherish our freedom. And we also recognize in this year that that freedom hasn't felt free for everybody. And we as a nation haven't done a good job of making sure that everybody who should have that freedom has it. The old documents that people wrote and signed talk about men being created equal, doesn't do a good job of including everybody. We know that our history in this country involves slavery and before that indentured servitude and that there were people who weren't free. We know that there are people who haven't been able to fully enjoy those freedoms ever since the very beginning of things. So how on earth do we celebrate freedom for real? not just with fireworks and music, but by looking at everybody and saying, hey, this means you too. Well, we do that by making sure that that freedom is actually available to everyone. It's a little bit, actually it's a lot, like our universalism. Universalism says that the love of God or that the love that we create and share the goodness of the world is all inclusive, should be available to each and every person, no matter who that person is, no matter where they're from, no matter what their life is like. Everyone is worthy of love. And in our case, in this country, we should be doing that very same thing with the idea of liberty and freedom. We should be making sure that that is available to each and every and all people. And it's hard to say that we are a free country when there are some people still here who are not. So when we see signs that say things like Black Lives Matter or Black Trans Lives Matter, or we see rainbow flags, or we see the one like the one that's now painted in Blueback Square, that's the progress pride flag that also has lines that are the trans pride flag, as well as um, black and brown lines to celebrate all people and include them too. When we see things like that, that's when we start to say, right, this is for everybody. And it's our responsibility to make sure that that's real. So how do we celebrate the fourth when we don't have fireworks in quite the same way as usual or barbecues or any of the other things that we normally would do with all sorts of other people? Well, I think the best way we can celebrate it is by doing everything we can to make sure that everybody, each and every and all people have that freedom. And in our tradition also are included in that love. May it be so. And I hope we take this opportunity today and every day to make that real. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Today we pray with the words of Bruce Southworth. Source of life and love, torn by desires to sit back and enjoy the beauty of the world to savor the blue skies and gentle days, and by desires to recast the world and to fight its evils, to save it. 
torn by all those things that hurt and confuse and make no sense amidst great beauty, yet supported by all those things that heal and hold us. Smiles, the touch of family and friend, mountain vistas, gentle waves, warm words. In the midst of all of this, we live in a mystery. We live sometimes <coughs> torn apart by so much glory and so much pain. We live in this moment held apart and yet striving for more and more connection. And so today, on this day after the fourth, we pray for our nation. That these turbulent times we are living through are not in vain, but rather inspire and declare a renewal of our commitment to ensuring that liberty and justice for all truly means what it says for all, for Black lives, for First Nations peoples, for the immigrants documented and undocumented whose humanity must be recognized and valued, even as we determine what immigration might mean, and for women and for trans folk, for queer people, for disabled people, the list is too long. Let this be a renewal of our commitment to ensuring that liberty and justice for all truly holds everyone who has found themselves deprived of liberty and justice in our nation. Let us pray that we stay open to learning, to growth, to transformation, so that we can bring our deepest and highest and best commitments into reality for each and every person, focusing on those who need us and our efforts most right now. And in this way, we live in faith, in trust, faith in ourselves and one another, in the trust that we can create bonds of the spirit that proclaim that we are not alone. We do have so much wisdom and love and health within us, we can live through the heartache into new life. And so for the grace of this world and for all of the tumble and challenge that might bring us to grace, oh, awesome. this day we give thanks. Amen. We are grateful for all the ways that you support us as a congregation and as your staff and the ways in which you support one another. Through these phone calls and Zoom gatherings, getting groceries for those who need them, taking physically distanced walks so that we are not super lonely, 
visiting one another from driveways and in backyards, and preparing for the day when the pandemic crisis comes to a close. Last month, we said that we would continue to do our plate sharing based on your generosity and the appreciation that you had for our outreach. And so we're continuing to do that now too. This month, we are sharing our offering with an organization called Campaign Zero. It's a nonprofit that supports the analysis of policing practices across the country, research to identify effective solutions to end police violence, technical assistance to organizers leading police accountability campaigns, and the development of legislation and advocacy to end police violence nationwide. This organization was started by some very prominent uh, uh, Black Lives Matter activists and uh, has been lifted up uh, nationally in a number of conversations, including things with Barack Obama and Brittany Packnett and DeRay McKesson. Um, this is a, a really um, remarkable organization. And so I encourage you to have a look at Campaign Zero. You should be able to find some links for it um, very easily if you Google Campaign Zero. Um, and we might even have that in our website or in our, sorry, in our chat box here. Um, so please take a moment to contribute. Anything that you contribute uh, this morning will be shared half with Campaign Zero and half with our congregation. We thank you for helping to make a difference in the world and for supporting our organization so that we can continue to support you. Thank you. And now let's join together in singing our doxology. Our readings today, our first one comes from Ganilla Norris, author and therapist, as she writes in A Mystic Garden. The deep urge in our souls wants grounding, needs light, longs for living water too. We cannot grow on our own any more than a, any plant in nature can. At the core, we know that of our own selves, we can do nothing. We are only what we are given, what we are able to receive and return. Fundamentally, we are beggars. Every living thing in this world is a beggar. Summer is a fullness born of need. How wonderfully strange and freeing it is to accept this basic property or this basic poverty. It makes for mutual acceptance of a fundamental emptiness. It makes us understand that we are part of the whole and therefore one with it. Isn't our task then to wait in dignity upon what brings us life? And so to wait upon each other. In lush abundance, how relieving it is to be stripped down to essentials to the bare truth that we are small, insignificant, and precious. This is what is real. To this essential poverty, all is given. Our second reading is Daisies by Mary Oliver. It is possible I suppose that sometime we will learn everything, everything there is to learn, what the world is, for example, what it means, 
I think this as I am crossing from one field to another in summer and the mockingbird is mocking me as one who either knows enough already or knows enough to be perfectly content not knowing. Song being born of quest he knows this. He must turn silent were he suddenly assaulted with answers. Oh, instead, oh, hear his wild, caustic, tender warbling, ceaselessly unanswered. At my feet, the white-petaled daisies display the small suns of their centerpiece. Their, if you don't mind my saying so, their hearts. Of course, I could be wrong, and perhaps their hearts are pale and narrow and hidden in the roots. What do I know? But this... It is heaven itself to take what is given, to see what is plain, what the sun lights up willingly. For example, I think this as I reach down, not to pick, but merely to touch, the suitability of the field for the daisies and the daisies for the field.
Thank you, Ted. So a couple of weeks ago, I said to you that I really just wanted to preach a light, easy, fun summer sermon. It is kind of my fondest wish for a Sunday right now. And I think that today's sermon and that one two weeks ago may be as close as we're going to get this year. And that's okay. There is a lot happening in the world this year. And there's a lot at stake. It's impossible to avoid questions like, who will we be as a nation? And who will we be in that striving as a congregation and as individuals? What I'm seeing this summer is that the reality is that there is abundance, but in waves. Abundant sunshine for a long time and a dearth of water. And now, many, many days in a row of rain, for which I and my well and my garden are deeply grateful, to be clear. Sometimes we have too many hard news days in a row. Too much awareness. An overwhelming amount of understanding that the world is imperfect. And then we also have some long and powerful stretches of people demanding better from our nation, and from one another. Bruce Southworth's prayer actually quotes and echoes the author E.B. White, who says, it's hard to know when to respond to the seductiveness of the world and when to respond to its challenge. If the world were merely seductive, that would be easy. And if it were merely challenging, that would be no problem. But I arise in the morning, torn between the desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world. And this makes it hard to plan the day. Yes, it is summer. And this should be a time for enjoyment and delight. As we know, summer is that time when things that grow need our tending and care whether it's food in the vegetable garden or children who are home from school, whether it's our souls or this year movements for necessary social change. Our own congregational adopted vision statement commits us to love and care, to change and growth, to the work of faithfulness and justice making. In any season, there is both work and play, seriousness and delight. And there is also the truth that none of this happens independently. And this summer season makes that plainer than ever. All of these ways in which we live depend upon one another for existence, survival, thriving. We see these interconnections in our need and our requirement to share our air and figure out how to do that in healthy ways. To work together to end oppressive and racist systems and actions. We see it even in the most basic of things to figure out how to make sure that grocery stores have the food that they need, to make sure that we give and receive the kindness that we need for us to figure out how to make sure that we help one another to have hope. Ganilla Norris writes, the deep urge in our souls wants grounding, needs light, longs for living water too, we cannot grow on our own any more than any plant in nature can. At the core, we know that of our own selves, we do nothing. We are only what we're given, what we are able to give and receive and return. Fundamentally, we are beggars. And summer is a fullness born of need. How wonderfully strange and freeing it is to accept this. 
It makes for mutual acceptance of a fundamental emptiness. It makes us understand that we are part of the whole and therefore one with it. So isn't it our task to wait in dignity upon what brings us life and therefore to wait upon one another? Norris's writing is challenging. She asks us to set aside the things in which we have learned to take pride. Place, things, jobs and positions, achievements that we see as only our own. She reminds us that at some level, everything we are and do is a product of our interconnectedness with one another and the whole of the cosmos. We rely on things that we cannot individually control for our sustenance, our safety, our comfort. We are part of the whole and therefore one with it. We can't escape the webs of existence, whether the food chain, the networks of family and friends and community, the interconnections of society that make for justice and injustice. The truth is we can't set any of those things down, even if we want to. What happens to any of us happens to all of us. And so when she asks us, isn't it our task then to wait in dignity upon what brings us life and so to wait upon one another? The only possible answer is yes. Our task in life is to wait upon, to serve that which holds our highest commitments and does good for one another and the whole of the world. And we know this as Unitarian Universalists who are in covenant with one another and the world. We must understand ourselves as interconnected in our saving and our savoring and our serving. Norris speaks of contemplation and action, seeking to know what is right and then creating that with one another. And if we pay attention to our full covenant, it does the same. We say, love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. We also say, slightly amended for our times, engage with the world in peace, have courage, hold on to what is good, return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the suffering, honor all beings. We can't help but understand ourselves as interconnected. We speak of love and spirituality as we hold both new vision and long-standing tradition. By being part of our covenant, we are called together into action and contemplation, to work and to worship. And it is summer. I can tell it's summer if only by the number of participants on our Zoom call right now. Even if I don't look outside the window and see the dappled sunlight on the trees and the flowers blooming in my yard, In summertime, these ideas are alive all around us in what brings joy and what cries out for attention, in what grows and in what we consume, in our engagement with communities that need us for our contributions to their economies and their struggles for justice, and our engagement with our own communities that nurture us, give us rest and comfort and respite and help us stay engaged. Whether we want to be or not, we are linked with all these things. We are part of the whole 
and therefore one with it. Mary Oliver writes, it is possible, I suppose, that sometime we will learn everything there is to learn. What the world is, for example, and what this means. I think this as I am crossing from one field to another in summer. What do I know but this? It is heaven itself to take what is given, to see what is plain, what the sun lights up willingly. For example, I think this as I reach down not to pick, but merely to touch the suitability of the field for the daisies and the daisies for the field. In writing about daisies in the summertime, Mary Oliver brings us to the knowledge of ourselves as part of the whole, asking us to seek truth and how to live in the world with that truth. What is this world? What does it mean? the wonders and the joys, the heartbreaks, the injustices and the imperfections. How do we live within that? How do we hold all of it together? And in the end, Mary Oliver finds a few answers and on a number of things she and Gunilla Norris agree. We only receive what we are given. It is our task to find the best of all things in the relationships for which we are made and to give and receive that best in each and every moment. That we do best when we discover the suitability of the field for the daisies and the daisies for the field. When we find our places where they are best where we can grow and live and thrive as best possible. And what I take that to mean is that as humans, we are suited to certain things, each of us to certain relationships or congregations or vocations or neighborhoods, and they require us as well. When I first was looking for a UU ministry, my very first search I actually applied to be the minister at the meeting house here in here in West Hart, or here in Hartford. I applied to four or five different congregations, and that was one of the ones that I had put in for. It was funny because I had forgotten that completely and just found their rejection letter in a file the other day. And they said something like, we see that you have great gifts for ministry but we think that you're probably not the right fit for us. They, I'm sure, were right. I am not suited to that field. And they probably aren't suited to me so well either. But what that means is that this field, our congregation, is where this daisy is best planted. And that this fits beautifully all together. They have found people to serve them. I have found people to serve. You have found me. One of the things that I know, again, is that some people are really suited to activism and some people are suited to contemplation. Some of us are prophets and some of us are peacemakers. And for this, I am grateful because it means that the gifts that I have, which are not the gifts of leading rallies and community organizing, can be used in a place where what we need is spiritual sustenance, teaching, growth. My gifts are well used with you and the rest of our staff and the rest of you bring your gifts and that makes us rich and whole and thriving. This is true for all of us. I know that I can't do everything. And in a summer full of abundance like this, if I tried, I would just expire. I only do some things really well. 
And there is too much to do, too much fun to have, too much justice to make, too much need to be met for any one of us to achieve alone. All of us need to find our best places and in concert, we create a world that is worth living in. In all the days of summer, we are inundated with life and all that it brings. And then in response to this, we are urged to grow as our best selves, as our best communities, making our best contributions to the whole and the health and the beauty and the joy and the justice of the world. So in this summertime, you might choose to lean into the ways of being that challenge you. Learn to protest a bit if it's not your nature. Go speak at a rally like I did when we dedicated that pride flag last week. Care for your soul if it's not something you do too often. Take a few minutes and take good care of yourself. Also use your best gifts, learn some new ones and do the things that you know you are good at and that other people need from you. Living through the summer might mean discovering more deeply for which relationships and situations we're made, how to grow and thrive in new directions, or perhaps how to receive gracefully and gratefully. If we live by our covenant, we will seek a balance for these things within ourselves and also among ourselves. We will offer one another our strengths, weaving together the variety of ways in which we meet our world's great need and one another's and our own too. I am grateful to be planted where I am planted now and planted where I was planted 15 years ago, the very first time around. That is what has helped me thrive. I hope that you are planted in all of your right places and growing and learning and becoming full and whole. May it be so. Amen. Let us speak together our unison benediction. Engage with the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. 
help the suffering, honor all beings. May it be so, and have a beautiful, beautiful week. Amen.